Good morning. This is Bill from Curious Cars and Auto House of Naples on another muggy, shitty, miserable, horrible, it's just horrible, Florida morning. I don't know what the hell day it is. It's probably Tuesday, I think. And uh, it doesn't really matter because Monday is like Tuesday is like Wednesday and so on and so on. Hot, muggy, humid, and miserable. And uh, here I am in Peter's driveway. Uh, his kid has just upped the ante. Now he's added all kinds of debris in the driveway to make my videos even more miserable for me. Uh, I looked around for a broom or a blower or something. There wasn't one, so... The hell with it. I guess he didn't like me calling him out on the Testarossa thing uh, the other day. So, uh, look, what I've got today is a 1988 Mercedes Benz 300 SE, uh, one of the hollow W126 cars, a true W126, because this is a uh, short wheelbase. And this is going to be a very quick take review. Now, I know that I often promise that, and then it turns into like a, you know, 53 minute video, but that is not going to be the case this time uh, because, yeah, frankly, I've done enough of these before. Uh, people really don't need to see them. Uh, but I got this car in. I absolutely love it. And I just want to share it because this... <sighs> This, to me, is just an epic, epic machine, and uh, this is going to be a true short take on that. Uh, on a, you know, at least I've got this going for me. It's a bird and other animal-free Florida morning. I didn't see a single one, and I can barely hear any birds in the trees, so uh, we're going to knock this thing out and move forward. Uh, you know, recently I did the goat flask giveaway that's still going on. I'm just about done with it. Hopefully the flasks head out uh, by the end of this week and uh, you know along with that came an ask me anything I, I pointed that out in the um, in the video where you had to enter uh, I'm gonna do a little ask me anything video and uh, if you have a question send it in you can still do that by the way because that isn't done yet and uh, if you want to send a uh, ask me anything to goat flask at gmail.com uh, go ahead but you better get it in the next couple days because otherwise it's gonna be over uh, that said one of the questions that I get asked a lot is, what's your favorite car? And, you know, man, I get asked that question all the time, and it's a virtually impossible question to answer. Uh, because while I hate a lot of cars, I do love quite a few. And, uh, you know, it's very difficult to see, oh my god, okay, if I had to have just one car, what would it be? Well. Here it is. This one is definitely in the running. There's, I mean, this is in, you know, everybody says the top five because it sounds better than the top ten. Uh, but this is truly, and I'm even going to give a top three. In fact, I immediately can't think of another car that if I could not own another one that I would probably want to have uh, as an all-around vehicle. This is it. So this is very much a contender for Bill's favorite car. If anyone were to care about such a thing, which nobody probably does, and I wouldn't blame them at all. Uh, but here it is. So look, this is a, again, 88 300 SE W126. Uh, <laughs> This review could read like a love letter, I mean, honestly, because I just absolutely adore this car, and I have for many, many years. And look, you guys out there who are expecting American cars and Malays cars and uh, Camaros, Firebirds, that sort of, you know I've got American car credentials. I love American cars. I grew up with them. Uh, I'm not a Euro weenie type. Uh, I did generate a love for European cars, you know, as I came up in the business. But this is beyond that. This that because it is such a tremendous vehicle uh, it just won my heart over completely and I consider it to be the last and best of the old guard German engineering and uh, that is a um, you know that really means something it's uh, here you go I'll, I'll sum it up I would argue that this is probably the finest analog car ever built and by analog I mean just pre all the 
gee whiz, abracadabra, fancy shit that came in later that I think just made cars absolutely soulless. And it only got worse through the 90s and 2000s to where we are today, uh, where virtually every single car just sort of acts and feels like another brand. Uh, the, the idea of cars having identity uh, it has just gone away. I mean, you know, they may look different. Maybe somebody came out with something that looks a little bit different, even though that's a stretch. Uh, but underneath, they just all feel the same. And uh, that is not true. So I'm going to consider this car absolute peak German engineering. And uh, as we quickly get into it, um, we're going to get into that. This car, it's just an absolute masterpiece. It's a masterpiece. Uh, the designers started work on this car in 1972. And, you know, the fact that it was still relevant and still modern and still in production in 1990 kind of gives you a clue to how forward thinking and talented the uh, engineers who put this car together were. They were the last of their breed. There is no way those guys still exist and uh, when they did my god could they put something together uh, they wanted the w126 to be the unquestionable champion uh, in areas of safety technology and efficiency and uh, of course efficiency was fairly new to them because that uh, you know came along in 72 with all the gas and oil crises and you know the uh, the rise of fuel prices and the Middle East the oil embargoes that sort of thing uh, Efficiency became a very big deal. And while that absolutely pummeled the American car industry in a way that, you know, took them years and years to recover from, uh, the Germans, and Mercedes-Benz in particular, uh, took it in stride. <laughs> they responded frankly with ease and they came out uh, ultimately with the W126 and they just absolutely nailed it. Uh, the car that preceded this was the W116 uh, of which this car shares a fair amount underneath with uh, but of course they took what they you know gained in that car and just expounded on it uh, but uh, and it was uh, followed by the W140 which many people consider to be a terrific car as do I. Uh, but I consider it to be wildly overcomplicated, difficult to maintain, and uh, just not up to the stand. I mean, again, to me, this is just the absolute pinnacle of analog engineering. It was designed by a guy named Bruno Sacco, a famous Mercedes-Benz designer. Well, he headed up the design team anyway, and of course there were a ton of people involved with it. Uh, but Bruno was the guy they answered to. And uh, he had been around Mercedes for a long time, and some of their most epic designs can be traced to him. He was a hell of a guy. Uh, and it's just... Uh, to me, it's the absolute last 100% perfect Mercedes. It just combines everything that a Mercedes-Benz should be and uh, does it in a package that, uh, you know, look, I could, I could rave on and on and on about it. Um, this to me is just wood, metal, leather, nuts and bolts, German engineering. It has just enough of the new technology, which of course a high-end Mercedes had to have, uh, but the bulk of it, the bulk of it is just classic, perfect German styling. Um, Okay, look, let's just get into this car. So you can see the style of it. First of all, you can see it has integrated bumpers. That was fairly new at the time. Uh, you know, when they were designing the car, they decided that big chrome bumpers were just not efficient. They were too heavy, they weren't aerodynamic, and uh, again, that was gonna be a part of what the 126 was gonna be. So uh, they came up with a composite front bumper. It looked like shit on a lot of cars when it happened. It looked terrific on this Mercedes. And again, I put that down to styling. Uh, at the same time, they did retain the traditional Mercedes grill uh, with the three-pointed star hood ornament. Uh, you know, they flushed the lights, at least they did on the, um, well, you know, look, you know, get into the early European cars, they all had flush lights. The American cars had uh, more exposed, sunken lights because of laws at the time. Uh, but this car, this 88, is a facelifted 126, which again, to me, is... I'm going to go with it being the pinnacle, and they did manage to make the lights very flush, very aerodynamic. They have the wipers, which look <laughs> absolutely terrific. It looks like this one needs a new wiper. It's a little thing is coming off, but anyway, whatever. Uh, needs uh, it, It's just a terrific front end on the car, and that was part of the aerodynamic. They shaped like five 
0.5 off the uh, drag coefficient over the W116, which made it just a much more aerodynamic car, made it smoother on the highway while getting better gas mileage. And these facelifted cars got additional aerodynamics. The earlier cars had what they called bunt cake wheels. Uh, these had flat wheels, uh, which uh, were more aerodynamic. The door handles were aerodynamic. They flushed the glass, they flushed the lights. <sighs> Man, do I just absolutely love this thing. So I tell you what, I'm going to pause for a minute. I'm going to get my shit together, and uh, then we're going to dive into the exterior styling of this car. When I open the hood, we'll get into why I love the 300 SE in particular, and uh, then we'll go from there. So bear with me one moment. All right, so let's just dive right into this thing. I mean, even today, this car looks fresh, current, timeless. Uh, at the time, it absolutely defined the 80s luxury car. Every other car was rated against the S-Class, and uh, you know, that is just a very special time for Mercedes. There was no BMW, or, I mean, they were out there. Look, there were Audis and BMWs out there, and they were expensive, and they were decent cars. But, uh, you know, forget about it. If you, would, if you were a CEO, or a doctor, a lawyer, a banker, stockbroker, third world dictator, uh, you know, if you were buying cars for the uh, embassies, if you were a gangster, a real really high-end drug dealer, even the Pope, then you drove an S-Class. Uh, if you made it, if you had made it, and you wanted other people to know that you had made it, uh, then you showed up in an S-Class. They were ridiculously expensive at the time, much more than most other cars. Uh, they were entirely... This is when engineers fully ran Mercedes-Benz. You know, they did when the 140 was made after this, but they took it to a level that just destroyed <laughs> absolutely everything. Uh, in the 80s, they had hit the perfect balance, and cars were built to a standard. Uh, these cars, they were not built to a cost. There was no true input for the engineers, or sorry, for the accountants. The engineers had their say, and they built a car to a standard, and that standard was what it was going to be, and the engineers had to suck it up and put a price on it at the end. And in this case, it absolutely worked. At the end of it, they had made almost a million 126s. Uh, it still remains the most successful S or Sonder class or special class of all time. Uh, you know, they've never exceeded the sales figures this car had, and uh, there was a good reason for that. Uh, you look at the subtle design, the lovely curves. You know, I talk about Mercedes-Benz cars being kind of humorless in German. Well, you know, I will argue that this car, I won't say it's funny, it certainly wouldn't be a stand-up comedian or anything, but it's not utterly humorless. It's got an elegance to it that could show, uh, you know, an old money guy with a bit of humor. All these subtle body lines, all these, you know, they don't in and of themselves do much, but when you put them all together, uh, it just ends up absolutely as a fantastic package. Uh, at the bottom, you see the gray contrasting color cladding. That was a uh, signature of Bruno Sacco at the time, and uh, in this car it was designed to limit rust. Also, of course, to make the front and rear bumpers composite for aerodynamics. Uh, at the back, you can see the ridged taillights. They're made to, um, you know, Mercedes Mercedes had customers all over the world in, in some very adverse weather conditions, whether it be, you know, the dust of Arabs in Dubai and uh, the icy snow of Russian gangsters in Siberia. And when these things got sand or snow on them, uh, it had a way of covering the taillights. Well, with these ridge taillights, uh, the inner part of them would remain uh, uncovered and then visible. Uh, while we're at the back, I can also point out that cars at this time, these German, were true imports, unlike today. Uh, if you look at almost the awkward positioning of the American taillight that goes, taillight, the American license plate that goes down beneath the uh, strip under the taillights, you can see that this car was designed to have a European license plate, or, you know, I think we're maybe one of the few countries that has this little rectangular thing. 
everything and it doesn't quite fit well uh, and you know today that's not going to be the case they're going to make a uh, rear panel that fits the American taillight perfectly back then this car was designed for another market and that uh, uh, taillight again I keep saying that uh, license plate is not meant to be there so uh, you can just tell that this was a true import uh, it's badged as a 300 SE and this is back when uh, Mercedes nomenclature made sense uh, the numbers denoted the engine size the letters denoted uh, the body and some other stuff in this particular case yeah it has a three liter inline six cylinder thus the 300 uh, the S is for special class or Sonder class the E is for Einspritzung or however the hell you say that which is fuel injection uh, there's no L behind it as there are in some of the you know 420 SEL 560 SEL uh, L would have donated long or long wheelbase this is a short wheelbase car uh, which is a true 126 by the way W126 I believe it was the V126s were long wheelbase and the C126s were the coupes uh, a la roadhouse <laughs> one of the most famous uses of a uh, coupe Mercedes-Benz uh, of course also if you watched Miami Vice there were plenty of AMG coupes but yeah anyway we'll get into that uh, the greenhouse on this car is perfection that's the area with all the glass in it above the top body line and uh, Bruno Sacco just absolutely nailed it on this one he said he missed it on the 140 uh, he made it too tall he wished he'd lowered it a little bit uh, well you don't hear Bruno Sacco say that he had any regrets on this car and uh, I can see why my lovely crease down the center of the door and other little crease above it angling in flushed glass lovely alumachrome trim around all the windows just the right amount of chrome trim on the car not actually chrome most of it but um, still very nice and lovely love the uh, aero wheels that do fill out the wells better than the uh, prior one uh, of course the lovely uh, vintage style Mercedes grill with the hood star uh, all in all I think the thing just absolutely looks terrific Terrific. And, uh, you know, almost a million of these cars built, many of them still going around today. Uh, you go to a bunch of embassies, you're still going to find them there. And uh, it's just, again, such a absolutely timeless design uh, that I just love it. I just absolutely love it. Um, so look, let's dive into this one, see what we got. Now, we'll start inside the trunk. I love the big uh, strip here that lets you, you know, lift. You got the three pointed star. Mercedes is going to dominate on uh, land, sea, and air. Very, very aggressive, angry logo. And a beautifully sized trunk. Uh, and nicely finished, but not over finished because it doesn't need to be. Uh, this car was built with engineering in mind. So you're going to fit all kinds of crap in there. You're going to fit toddlers, infants. You could even fit some, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten year olds in there with no problem. And uh, they're going to be fairly happy. I mean, they're not going to be climate controlled, but they'll be, uh, you know, they got lots of room to spread out, and that's not a bad thing. Uh, get under here, and they've hidden the spare tire. Uh, they give you a full-size spare with a proper alloy wheel, so when you put it on, it all looks, hey, look, let's say the Pope gets a flat tire. Uh, they have to put on another one. Well, he's not going to want to drive around with a temp spare on there, you know? I mean, the Pope shows up with a temp spare. Everyone's going to scratch their head, and they may, you know, become Methodist. So um, they had to give you uh, a factory alloy on there to make it proper. Uh, everything looking nice. You can see over to the right of the spare tire is the hidden vacuum pump. Uh, Mercedes for many years has used vacuum for things that other companies use electrics for like door locks and that sort of thing even windows and seats and some of the older benzes uh, but uh, either way the vacuum runs all the locking system in this car which is terrific and everything just looks great uh, you can see it's got the VIN tag on here you'll see that in this uh, era of Mercedes when theft was becoming a thing they stamped every panel with the VIN uh, which uh, you know when the car would get stripped by some sort of you know black marketeers uh, they'd be able to trace it back uh, also a nice way to see that the car has all original body panels and paint like uh, for instance this pretty low mileage car does even the way the door closed you know you don't need to press a button and have the trunk close it just closes perfectly without it oh god this was really the last of its kind tremendous engineering this car you pull this guy out 
lift up on the hood and uh, there we go. So this is an M103 inline six cylinder. Uh, in many ways, this was the weakest engine put in one of these things. And some people don't like it as such. Uh, they would prefer the diesels, which are terrific, obviously, uh, or the 420 SEL, which was a 4.2 liter V8. Uh, the 500, which was uh, one year, maybe two years in America, you know, many more years in Europe. Uh, there were also two, eight, I mean, there were like eight, nine, ten different engines globally you could get in these cars. Uh, even in some countries they had 2.8 uh, inline sixes with manual gearboxes. That has to be a neat car, uh, but we never got one in America. Uh, this was the smallest gas engine you could get in the States, which was the M103. Also, you would have found it in uh, E-classes at the time, the W124. Uh, you could get it in the uh, R107, uh, although not in America. The 300 SL was a European car. Uh, and it's a thing. Look, there's never really been a bad inline six in anything. I mean, inline sixes are just this beautifully, by their nature, balanced, lovely engine. And uh, when you have a bunch of high end German engineers put one together in the past, it just got better. Uh, that's what made BMW. Uh, and that's why I think it's such a shame that the inline six has gone the way of the Dodo Bird and been replaced by a Turbo Four. Uh, there just was no better, smoother engine to me than an inline six. You can see everything lovely under here. Uh, you know, these cars pioneered a lot and there was a lot of interesting shit. Uh, you know, it wasn't the first car to have ABS brakes, but it was the first to have traction control. And uh, it was one of the most uh, first cars to prolifically have ABS. Uh, it also did things like, you know, heated up the, um, uh, the windshield wa you see this here right the windshield washer as a, they they heated it up so that the uh, it wouldn't freeze up in in German weather very very nice stuff uh, look at the linkage of the throttle there it's just unlike anything else at the time and uh, you could just see the build quality in every aspect of this car just absolutely terrific and uh, I just love it so anyway the six cylinder to me is one of the finest uh, that you can get some people see it as an underpowered S-Class, which is fine. That's their prerogative. I almost see it as the ultimate E-Class in a way, you know, taking an E and stretching it and making it more substantial. And uh, that may be a big re... Because, look, it's more... Being the short wheelbase, it's more nimble. It's easier to fling this car around. Uh, it's not as bulky as the 420s or the 560s or even the 300s with the long wheelbase. Uh, it feels more like an E when you're driving it around. Uh, it's easy to park. You've got four-wheel independent suspension, obviously. You've got ABS brakes, four-wheel discs. You've got the world's best turn radius uh, on this car. The, it would just blow your mind how well these cars steer into a parking spot and uh, the 300 SE to me is probably the most nimble and uh, drivable of the 126s and it does not sacrifice too much uh, in the way of uh, high I mean yeah you don't get the crazy V8 power but you get enough and it keeps up with traffic and it's lovely and even the gas mileage isn't that terrible so uh, I tell you what I'm getting at my crap in the trunk uh, we're gonna hop in this car have a look at the interior and then go for a spin so bear with me one moment. So let's have a look inside this thing. Here real quick, through the back window, you can see that there are two compartments on the package shelf. Uh, the one on the driver's side houses the uh, first aid kit, which is nice and comprehensive. Let's see if we can have a look at that. All right, then in here, we're gonna find everything a wounded German might need. So look at the size of this thing, good God. Uh, and there you go. So, I mean, if you need to do any kind of field dressing, I don't know what these Germans are expecting people to encounter on the road, but you've got it all. I mean, if you, you know, have an arm lopped off, you're going to be in good shape if you got this thing around. So, uh, anyway, nice that that is uh, still with the car. And let's see if we can get it back in there. There's everything. It's difficult one-handed. 
Uh, you've got nice rear headrests there that uh, fold down. Uh, despite being the short wheelbase, you still have pretty good foot room for your Canadians. They're not going to be too miserable. And they have this lovely, expansive, beautiful, rich leather uh, with perforation for, you know, their comfort. They got an armrest. They've got little nets here for their, uh, you know, Uzis or Mac-10s or whatever it is they need to keep with them. You've got lovely little reels of Burano wood inserts on the uh, door panels. Uh, materials and a fit and finish in an 80s Benz is really unlike anything else in the world. Uh, you've got the perforation in the door panels of these earlier ones. And uh, you can see the air flows in. Uh, through here, through the front seats, back into the uh, C pillar, and then into the doors where it emanates uh, air conditioning or heat through there to, you know, keep passengers comfortable. And of course, you have a couple ashtrays because people still smoked in the 80s. So uh, everything lovely back there. And the door latches. I mean, look at these things. They're just like any, I mean, you would have seen this on a Panzer tank uh, going into this thing. And as a result, you get that uh, real bank vault feeling when you close the door, which is just absolutely terrific. Uh, in the front, again, this is just all build quality, fine materials, fine leather, fine wood, fine everything, and none of that gee whiz plastic fantastic crap that defines every car today. Uh, you know, they didn't need to wow you with lights and circuitries and fancy, and well, the stereos are a bit epic, but we'll get into that. But it is true analog quality, this car, and that's part of what made them so epic in my mind. Uh, this was one of the first cars to have like 93 three-way power seats. Uh, it's got this sort of representative switch, which I think looks great. It's got memory seats. It's got uh, power headrests, which even today wow people a little bit. And uh, I think it just all looks terrific. So let's hop in and fire this thing up. And again, I mean, the sound when you close the door. It does give you that sort of German irritating warning buzzer. Probably would have been better if I didn't have my seatbelt on, but or did, but uh, anyway, it is what it is. Get a bit of AC going as well. It's hot as balls around here. So again, lovely little treatment from the Zebrano wood flowing from the door panels into the dash, across the dash, and back into the door panel. Uh, going into the climate control area, going into this Becker radio with this rather ridiculous looking um, hieroglyphics. There's a nice little ashtray here. Uh, you've got a gated shifter, which is uh, kind of a Mercedes thing. Beautiful condition of the Zebrano wood. Uh, your power windows. This power mirror switch operates uh, the passenger side power mirror only because, well, you're right here, so you've got a manual one. <laughs> this is so German from the time. You never get this kind of crap today, and I just think that's cool. So it's got one power mirror adjustment for your remote mirror only. Uh, instrument cluster-wise, you've got your uh, fuel, you know, of course, in German hieroglyphics, R for refill, one half, one one. Uh, you see premium unleaded fuel only. You got your uh, temperature there in Celsius, you've got your oil pressure, you've got an economy gauge. When you're in the red, it means you're hitting the gas too hard. You got 160 mile an hour speedo. Uh, you can see just 43,000 miles on the clock, which is epic. Uh, also a, uh, a red line just a little bit over six, which was very high for the time. And uh, of course, then a row of German hieroglyphic uh, warning lamps for, you know, whenever you need it. Uh, no tilt, but it does have a power telescope. Uh, which, of course, the steering wheel is on an angle, so it almost acts like a tilt. Uh, you've got these classic uh, Mercedes-Benz stocks, your st uh, uh, cruise control on the top, your wipers and uh, dimmer here on the uh, bottom, all very nice stuff. Your key uh, ignition is on the dash. Uh, open up the glove box. The books are in a folder at work, but um, you know, I don't know the point of these cup holders. Uh, Germans of this era did not have cup holders because they thought it was tacky and weird to be drinking while you're driving around. Yeah, who knows, but um, later on they gave in to that and brought in cup holders. But I guess if you're having a little picnic, they give you a place to put uh, a couple of cups because God knows if you're driving, uh, while you have those cups up there, they're going to go flying. 
uh, up here you have a pretty standard uh, rear view mirror, nice stuff. You've got this, uh, this all flashes with fasten your seatbelt shit when you start it. Uh, you do have a couple of cocaine mirrors. This one's got a crack in it. Didn't know that happened. That probably is new. So we'll see if we can't fix that before it goes out. Uh, this one doesn't, but it's nice that they're both still working. And uh, you have a giant power sunroof, which really lets in the uh, day or night sky. Lovely stuff. You have a retractable center armrest, a little place to put crap there in the center. And get my seatbelt on. We're gonna go for a spin. You also get oh shit handles there, 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 and there. So plenty of those going around. All right. Uh, this is interesting. The uh, Becker stereo here, which again, with all the crazy German hieroglyphics, which you really have to read the book to understand, uh, does have a cassette deck. We can help evaluate current coverage. Let's see if we got anything on the radio. Um, for sure we go in the water. Nothing. No, it doesn't matter. Anyway, there it is. Uh, very nice radio. But the fader control is here. Why? Who knows? Ask a German. Let's go for a spin. Uh, now, when you're looking out the vista of this car, out the window, and you see that big three-pointed star ahead, uh, as I've said many times before, when I, you just feel like the chairman of the board. I mean, there are very few cars which give you that lovely feeling of having made it. And here, this car is what? It's an 88 model. I mean, you're talking about something that's like 40 years old. I, I, okay, so I'm, let me do some math here. Uh, 12 plus uh, 20, I don't know, 30 some years old. And it still feels regal and elegant and lovely. I mean, very few cars, I don't think any car has aged as gracefully as the uh, 126 has. And the drive, I mean, this thing only has 43,000 miles, so it's, you know, pretty epic in terms of not being worn out. Uh, but the drive just feels so modern and lovely. I mean, you've got the recirculating ball steering, so uh, it feels expensive, it feels substantial. Uh, Four-wheel discs with ABS that absolutely feel like modern braking. I mean, it just comes to a stop in no time. Uh, it's responsive, uh, it handles bumps well. Uh, it's just one of the finest driving cars that you're ever gonna be in, and it's ancient. I mean, try doing this in a mid-80s Camaro. I mean, it just... Mercedes was building cars on another level at that time. And uh, we talked about the 124, which is their mid-size car. And uh, that car probably was more important in terms of influencing other vehicles. Uh, but this car is truly the pinnacle, I think, of German engineering at the time. A nice guy walking his little dog. I think that's the uh, compatriot of the woman in the funny hat. So I don't know what happened to her. I hope she's okay. Uh, anyway, the six-cylinder provides plenty of pep to me. I mean, it probably has 160 horse or something, but it's got, you know, again, it's a six. It's a big six, and it gives you the smoothness and loveliness that a six gives you. Uh, it, you know, they can try to mimic that with a turbo four, uh, but it just, you, you can tell. I'm not fooled. You can pipe in engine sounds. You can do what you want, but it doesn't matter. A turbo four just does not feel like a big six. Four-speed transmission shifts very smoothly, electronically controlled. Uh, it's got an airbag, driver's airbag, this thing, so you're pretty safe. It's got crumble zones. Honestly, I'd, probably, I'd rather get in a collision in this car than I would in a new Celica. I think you're going to be safer. Uh, back in the late 80s, this was um, credited with being the absolute safest car on the road at the time. And my God, to drive it, man. They're just, no, I mean, you feel so insulated from the road, uh, you know, a la Cadillac or Lincoln, uh, while at the same time having this sort of almost sports car 
uh, responsiveness and you know the feel for you just feel completely in tune with driving uh, in a way that few cars are able to uh, mimic today you know this is the best again I would argue it is the best analog car ever made in the steering feel the braking feel the shifting the driving if you love driving you're gonna love driving this car Kickdown's perfect. It'll cruise at 100 miles an hour, uh, get respectable fuel mileage, and there it is. Keeping in mind, this is going to be a short video. I've got an 80s Lincoln coming up in a couple days. We'll make a long one out of that, I'm sure. Uh, but this one, I've done enough of them that, um, you know, I don't need to expound on it. Uh, just an absolutely fantastic machine. Terrific to drive in every way, and uh, I think probably inarguably one of the best cars ever built and I'm gonna give it my top three probably number one but uh, you never know maybe something else will eek in something with love but uh, either way I love this car uh, this is an 88 it's finished in Cabernet red metallic with uh, cream beige leather inside uh, 43,000 miles absolutely stunning car uh, one of the best preserved old ones I've seen in a long time uh, I think it's getting like I, I fantasized about keeping this, but I'm not a very good steward for cars. I just don't have a place to keep them indoors. Uh, I'm not going to take a car like this and let it be outside. It would be terrible. It would be a crime against humanity. Look at this Audi running up the left hand side. Yeah, he wishes he had this elegance. He really does. Um, so I'm probably not going to keep it. You can check it out at Auto House. Uh, of Naples uh, if you have an interest. They're on uh, the phone at 239-263-8500 or autohousenaples.com. Uh, thank you so much for having a look. Really appreciate it. Got more in-depth stuff coming up soon. Uh, flasks are going out soon. I'll let you know when they do. And uh, thank you again for uh, looking, watching, subscribing, commenting. Uh, there's some douchebag doing uh, some sort of scam things about winning contests in the replies. Please ignore those. I delete them as quickly as I can, but YouTube's been no help at all in trying to get rid of them. So uh, I promise you I've never replied to a comment letting anyone know they want anything because I have nothing to give you. And and uh, I just don't find that an interesting way to do it. So uh, thank you for having a look. Really appreciate it. And we will see you with the next one. Take care.